Good evening. I'm Kathleen, Kathleen Wong Lau, and I'm the Chief Diversity Officer in the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at San Jose State University. I'm honored to welcome you to our inaugural Transforming Communities, a movement to racial justice, an event that stretches over the next two weeks. Before I go on, I want to remind folks that there is closed captioning at the bottom. There's an option for live transcript if you just click on the bottom of the screen. I want to start by giving a special welcome to the Honorable Chairwoman Nishma and Honorable Vice Chairwoman Adiano of the Muekma Ohlone Tribe. On behalf of San Jose State University, we welcome you to tonight's event and keynote. Transforming Communities offers opportunities for participants to gain a wealth of information and experience as you engage with content centered at the intersection of race and topics such as inequality, systemic injustice, community healing and restoration, human rights, sexuality and gender, and so much more. There is a wide range of topical areas and approaches, whether in creative activities such as community arts and creative writing, to social and political science and analysis of data and policies and practice, to acts of activism directed at systemic change. Transforming Communities is a project that reflects the larger mission of San Jose State University to be a responsible partner and a leader on enacting systemic racial equity. As the largest public university in this region, our current students, staff, and faculty, and alumni are drawn from this entire region. Our campus community and their families populate and contribute to local communities, as well as utilize the amazing services and programs in this local community. We have a mutually beneficial relationship and a mutually informed relationship. Transforming Communities is led by our community and government relations team in the Office of the President. Co-chairs Jamal Williams and Edwin Tan have led this collaborative partnership between SJSU and community organizations. It is our hope that the sessions and work provides opportunities to learn from and engage with the cumulative work of featured speakers and presenters. We hope to provide a joint community space where we can engage in work that challenges all of our sectors to examine, reflect, and take action towards systemic racial and ethnic equity and systemic indigenous and sovereignty-based equity. The range of presentations is amazing from tonight's keynote from Dr. Andrew Jolivet, whose work on indigenous ways of knowledge making can inspire us to use place based knowledge in our work on transformative justice to presentations on topics that range from the new human rights frontier artificial intelligence and data privacy to healing space um, anti racist San Jose talk justice and San Jose strong presentations to understanding intersectional issues for farm worker families to National Book Award winning writer educator Viet Thanh Nguyen in the closing keynote on November 12th. On behalf of San Jose State University, I welcome you to our first annual Transforming Communities, a movement to racial justice. Thank you. Well, how are ya? Welcome everyone. My name is Ryan Ward and I serve as the Director of Advocacy and Federal Relations in the Office of the President at San Jose State. I come from the Calus tribe up in the Pacific nor Northwest where we are known as Cedar and Salmon people. Normally at the beginning of events like this, we read a land acknowledgement that recognizes the Muekma Ohlone tribe as the original stewards of the land on which our main campus currently sits. Today, however, I have the special honor and privilege of introducing the leadership of the Muekma Ohlone tribe to do such an, an acknowledgement in their own words. We are incredibly fortunate to have both the chairwoman and vice chair from the tribe with us this evening. In the interest of time and because we want you to hear directly from them, I will briefly introduce both now, but we will be adding a link to their full bios in the chat as well. Charlene Nijma is the chairwoman of the Muekma Ohlone tribe. She is from the Marine Sanchez lineage that descends from the first peoples of the San Francisco Bay Area. Her ancestors are direct descendants of those peoples brought into the mission system at Santa Clara, Mission San Jose, and Mission Dolores in San Francisco. In 2018, Charlene was elected as tribal chairwoman to help lead her people after the retirement of her mother, Rosemary Canberra. As chair of the tribe, she represents over 600 tribal members who, uh, who comprise the 10 lineages of the previously recognized but never terminated Verona Band of Alameda County. She is also the president of the tribe's cultural resources management firm, which is devoted to preserving the material and cultural heritage of the Moak Maloney tribe. Chairwoman Nijma's mother, Rosemary, has been an active 
and persistent advocate of indigenous rights in the San Francisco Bay Area for over 40 years. And Charlene has worked to carry on her mother's legacy to improve the lives of tribal members. Monica Ariano serves as the vice chairwoman for the tribe. She also holds various positions within the tribe where she is charged with protecting, protecting the tribe's Aboriginal and religious rights while caring for the proper and respectful treatment of their ancestral remains and cultural or artifacts. Among other important duties, she is proactively restoring her tribe's language while also working on interpretive museum displays and various publications about the tribe's 10,000 year history and heritage. More recently, Monica has been appointed as the vice president for the Muwekma Ohlone Preservation Foundation, the tribe's land trust, where she is helping the tribe access land and reconnect tribal members to the land and indigenous knowledge through stewardship. She has the authority and privilege to issue land acknowledgements and public welcoming declarations to Morkama's ancestral land on behalf of the tribe, which she'll do today. Lastly, Monica also has the honor of giving opening blessings in the tribe's native Tochenyo language. I'll now welcome the chairwoman and vice chair to our virtual stage. Horsetuhi, Kanakrakat, Monica Villariano, Witcher's Kuchu, Shmoak Maloni Tribe, San Francisco Bay Area Talk. Good day. I greet you in our native Chochenyo language. I am Monica Villariano. I am the Vice Chairwoman for the Moak Maloni Tribe of the San Francisco Bay Area. As traditionally done and in honor of our ancestors, we offer an opening prayer in our native Chochenyo language as a blessing for today's event. Moakma Isai Chochenyo, the people's prayer in Chochenyo. <clears throat> Exu yakma, ekachokma, tuhi, hoshe roket, amakam, kam haik ne nomo, hemeta makin, makrote himetka, makin mak alshi, takamishik hiti nomo, hemen heesmin, menehishne, ki nish makin, makish hoshe makinan, tamakrote himetka, mat hierku, ruai, tamakami aye, tamakrote himetka, haiki mak makinan, Tamakrote himerka, holie mak mak ruye, heme tamakin hishmet sin, makishoshe makinan, itashbuk makam, makiwe. Thank you. Maki mak moakma wulbulam, akoi makware, mani mak hiswe. We are moakma aloni. Welcome to our ancestral homeland. In honor of our ancestors, we would like to now read the following moakma aloni tribal land acknowledgement. Moakma wulbulam, warep tashu. Moak Maloney Tribal Land Acknowledgement for San Jose State University and the city of San Jose, Thamian Ancestral Moak Maloney Territory. We would like to recognize that while we have the State University and the city of San Jose gathered on this territory, Thamian Maloney Tribal tribal groups of the greater Santa Clara Valley, which includes the lands of the Alzons, Thamian, Matatlans, and Baleños, whose tribal region was named after our powerful chief, Capitan Bala, as well as the two Mexican land grants located in the East Hills above San Jose, and who were intermarried with the direct ancestors of some of the lineages enrolled in the Huacualoni tribe of the San Francisco Bay Area, all of whom were missionized into Mission Santa Clara, San Jose, and San Francisco. <clears throat> the present day Moakwaloni tribe with an enrolled Bureau of Indian Affairs documented membership of over 600 members is comprised of all the known surviving Indian lineages Aboriginal to the San Francisco Bay region who trace our tribe's ancestry through the mission Santa Clara, San Jose and San Francisco, which were established during the advent of the Hispano-European Empire's invasion into Alta California beginning in AD 1769. And we are the successors and living members of the sovereign historic, previously federally recognized Verona Band of Alameda County, now formally recognized as the Moak Maloney Tribe of the San Francisco Bay Area. Moakma means la gente, the people in our native Chochenyo Ohlone language. The lands on which San Jose State University and the city of San Jose has been established was and continues to be a great spiritual significance and historical importance for our Muwekma Ohlone tribal people. This region extends to surrounding areas that held several Tupintocs, traditional semi-subterranean spiritual roundhouses, 
Tupin talks were places of celebration, healing, spiritual cleansings, rituals, dances, intertribal feasts, and religious ceremonies, which were once located on the historic Lupi Negos land grant, Rancho Posormi y Positas de las Animas, Little Wells of Souls, and also at Marcelo, Pio, and Cristobal's land grant, Rancho Ulistac, as well as our historic Alisandra Rancheria, located near Pleasanton in the East Bay. Also nearby ancestral heritage shell mound sites served as the tribe's territorial monuments and traditional cemetery sites for high lineage families, craft specialists, and fallen warriors. The region surrounding the city of San Jose within the greater Santa Clara Valley is where many of the tribe's ancestral heritage cemetery and village sites are located, especially adjacent to freshwater corridors where many have been destroyed as a result of unbridled development. These localities are viewed as historic and sacred places for our tribe. And it is acknowledged that these lands had been previously settled, harvested and controlled by ancestral Moekma tribal groups for many thousands of years. Today, our Moekma Ohlone tribal leadership and members work as stewards addressing and protecting many of our up to 10,000 year old ancestral heritage village and cemetery sites such as the old Holiday Inn site located downtown along Tamian Rume, the Lupe River. Along Maya Rume, Coyote Creek. On the area along with lineages are directly Aboriginal to the Thamian Ohlone tribal territory, whose families had affiliation with Mission Santa Clara. Also, some of the enrolled Moekma lineages are descended from direct ancestors from neighboring Ohlone tribes and who were intermarried with Mission Santa Clara Clareño Indians. It is important that we pause and recognize the history of the land of the Thamian Ohlone on which we gather to participate, learn, and honor, but also recognize that the first people of this region, our Muwekma Ohlone people, are alive and thriving members of the San Jose and broader Bay Area communities today. Even though our tribe was denied a land base through the gross negligence of derelict BIA officials after our tribe was first federally recognized in 1906, because of the tenacity, strength, and legacy of our ancestors and elders that our tribe has been able to maintain our identity and traditions and keep our culture and our language alive today. Furthermore, our Moekwa Ohlone Indian families have never left our Ambr Aboriginal ancestral homelands of the Bay Area. Today, we attempt to repair the sustained ecological, environmental, and cultural devastations to our tribe wrought by by over 251 years of colonial processes of disenfranchisement through the politics of erasure. We are focused on keeping our traditional culture strong while we work for a bright and favorable future for our children and the ensuing generations as we follow in the footsteps of our ancestors. We respectfully request that the good citizens of the city of San Jose and surrounding towns strive to be faithful stewards on behalf of the Moakmaloni tribe by maintaining the bay, freshwater creeks, native plants, animal habitats, and the air we all breathe. Furthermore, we request that San Jose State University, the city of San Jose and surrounding towns within Santa Clara County honor the military service of the Muakma men and women who have honorably served overseas during World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Desert Storm, Iraq, and who are still serving in the United States Armed Forces today. And honor the tribal veterans and service members from California, North and South America who have served this country with dignity and honor. In closing, it is of great spiritual significance to acknowledge the special relationship of this Orshewadet beautiful land to our indigenous Moekma Ohlone tribe of this region, as well as to all people residing in the Bay Area. We respectfully request that everyone who lives, works, or visits San Jose State, the city of San Jose, and surrounding towns to be respectful of our Aboriginal lands and natural habitat and consistent with our principles of community diversity and inclusion, strive to be good citizens on behalf of the Mwak Maloney tribe on whose Aboriginal lands were you are guests. Makis Horsha Makinan Utashbo Makam Makiwe. Thank you and on behalf of the Mwak Maloney tribe, we hope you celebrate honor and stand in solidarity with all indigenous people with our sustained struggles to reverse the adverse colonial legacies 
affecting all people of color in San Jose, the greater Bay Area, California, the United States, and the Americas, as we gather and reflect on the sacred lands of the Famian Ohlone. Aho, Ishwar Shekina, thank you. Arshemur, good evening. That's good evening in our Chochenyo language. My name is Charlene Nijme, and I'm the chairwoman for the Moak Maloney tribe. Thank you for inviting me to say a few words at this symposium and speak on these issues of social and racial justice and what it means to the Indians, the Indian tribes, and more specifically to the Moekma Ohlone tribe of the San Francisco Bay Area. The Moekma Ohlone tribe today is comprised of all the known surviving American Indian lineages aboriginal to the San Francisco Bay region who trace their ethno-historic origins from the indigenous tribes who continues, continuously occupied these lands for over 10,000 years. Upon arrival of the Spanish in the late 1700s, all of the Moekma members were involuntarily confined at the three Bay Area missions, Mission San Jose, Mission Santa Clara, and Mission Dolores. After secularization of the missions in 1834, most of the mission Indians who were rounded up from, the, from outside the Ohlone speaking territories left the area returning to their non Ohlone villages. But those who remained in the former Ohlone speaking territory coalesced into a distinct community living on two Indian rancherias in Pleasanton and Niles, where they were able to revive revive indigenous cultural practices, such as the sweat lodge and ceremonial dances. They were comprised of those who came from Ohlone speaking villages, but also from Miwok, Yokut, Wapo, and Patwin speaking tribes. These two rancherias were very close to, to each other and formed a single distinct community that was well known locally. In 1906, our tribe were identified and included in a census ordered by Congress of landless California tribes. Being identified on the 1906 census and thereafter being named in 1914 and again in 1927 on a list of tribes to receive land by Congress effectively gave the Moekma people acknowledgement, also known as recognition as an American Indian tribe to be clear, Muwekma's existence and identity do not depend on federal recognition or acknowledgement. The community, meaning the people, make up the tribe, and we are a tribal community long before the federal government recognized us. Federal recognition does not create tribes. It recognizes social, political communities that predate the United States. And it creates a trust relationship between the tribe and the federal government, which entitles tribes and other members to certain federal benefits and triggers the operation of a whole body of U.S. law involving respect for tribal sovereignty, including the protection and repatriation of our ancestral remains. In essence, it legitimizes, it legitimizes our right of self-determination as a sovereign people on our own lands. Tribal nations ceded millions of acres of land that make up the United States and what, what it is today, and in return, receive the guarantee of ongoing self-government on their own lands. This right of sovereignty and self-determination was promised in perpetuity to tribal nations and that government to government relationship can only be terminated by Congress. Although, although we were known locally by many names, Mission San Jose Indians, Pleasanton Indians, Ohlone Indians, in 1914, the Indian agency without informing the tribe or anyone else labeled us Verona Band after a railroad station on, the, on land owned by Phoebe Hearst. And even though the Verona Band was listed in 1914 and again in 1927 on the list of tribes to receive land, an Indian agent without the benefit of a site visit reported that the tribe was not in need of land and removed, from, and removed Verona Band from the list of tribes to receive land. These two actions are errors made by the department of mislabeling the tribe as Verona Band 
and refusing to buy us a land base that was mandated by Congress was the beginning of our political erasure and our disenfranchisement. Although the Bureau of Indian Affairs has admitted that the Muwekma was acknowledged as a federally recognized tribe in 1927 and that our status was never terminated by Congress, they still neglected to place our tribe on the first official 1978 list of federally recognized tribes. So after 1978, their negligence of not placing us on the list effective, effectively took away our sovereign rights without any congressional ter termination or due process. When our tribe sought to clarify our status in the early 1980s, the BIA claimed we were no longer considered a tribe and that for reasons they themselves didn't understand, our tribe had withered away. Even when we presented clear evidence of our existence from the late 1700s to present day, the BIA rejected our evidence and made a final determination that we no longer existed as a tribe. But of course, we had not withered away. Their conclusions that we cease to exist as a tribal community is not supported by facts or evidence. After 40 years of struggles, I have witnessed and have come to the very sad realization that evidence and facts don't really matter much to the powerful. I once believed that the department's indifference and neglect was to blame, but now I see the purposeful actions that led to our erasure. They misnamed us on purpose. They removed us from the list of tribes to receive land on purpose. They left us off the 1978 list of recognized tribes on purpose. They misconstrued, incorrectly evaluated, or completely ignored our evidence when they evaluated our petition for acknowledgement on purpose. The question we ask ourselves over and over is why us? Why Muwekma? Why did the BIA correct the status of other California tribes like the Ion Band of Miwoks, Lower Lake Rancheria, and the Tohon Band by the stroke of a pin? The department admitted these tribes had once been recognized, had never been terminated, and continue to exist to present day. So they simply restored their status administratively. So why not treat Muwekma equally? The answer is as plainly simple as it is plainly wrong. They would never allow such valuable San Francisco Bay Area real estate to belong to the indigenous population. It is a coincidence that prior to contact with Europeans, what, did it, what is today the present state of California had the largest native population of any comparable area in the US but today there are no federally recognized tribes in the entirety of the San Francisco Bay Area. They attempted decades of extermination, then assimilation and finally termination. Where is the support from Awekma? It's been 40 years and my people are still waiting for justice. It is justice to refuse to support our rightful claim of self-determination as a sovereign people just because my ancestors inhabited a land where gold was discovered and then Silicon Valley was built. Are we to suffer because our ancestors inhabited the San Francisco Bay region over 10,000 years ago and we the Moek Maloney people still reside in our ancestral lands? Even today's era of social and racial justice, the Moek Maloney people are still being ignored. And those institutions who stayed in silence during our political erasure are complicit in our injustice. The politicians who have ignored our calls to help restore our status are also complicit in our injustice. Justice is the concept of fairness. Racial equity or racial justice is the fair treatment of all people, resulting in fair opportunities and outcomes for everyone. Social justice is fairness as it manifests in society. It means that everyone's human rights are respected and protected. But the idea of fairness has never applied when it came to the treatment of Native Americans who inhabited these lands for over 10,000 years. 
the Mowak Maloney tribe was a federally recognized tribe and our status was never terminated by Congress. But that did not stop the Department of Interior from saying we withered away and that today we are not considered a tribe and that it is now our obligation to improve, to prove to the very government that tried to exterminate us that we still exist and have continued to exist as a tribe. Stephen Quinsbury, an attorney from California Indian Legal Services once wrote a position paper on the federal recognition process for unrecognized tribes. And he starts by saying, the government, which in many instances actively participated in the destruction of tribal communities in California, now sits in critical judgment through its agencies and the federal acknowledgement process of the tribal status of these groups. This absurd situation should be changed through effective intervention of Congress. The Bureau of Indian Affairs has seven criteria. We are required to, to meet to have our status restored as a tribe. That process has been criticized as being unfair for decades, but the branch chief of the, of the Bureau of Acknowledgement is quoted as saying, fairness is not our eighth criterion. So if fairness is not a criterion, then ex by extension, justice is not a criterion for the federal government. This is not surprising to us Native Americans, but it should be distressing to all of us that nothing has really changed, especially in this current era of social and racial justice. Movements for, for specific social justice issues are born when people identify injustices and have a strong belief that something must be done to rectify the injustices. Talking, recognizing, and apologizing for injustice is only the beginning of a true social justice movement. For healing and a path forward, injustice demands justice and wrongs must be righted. Otherwise, we are just pointing out the past. Without justice, there can be no peace. For example, Native Americans today still suffer from generational trauma because the enslavement, exploitation, discrimination, and violence against our people and our ancestors. We have the highest poverty rates among any minority groups, the highest rates of drug and alcohol abuse, the highest rates of diabetes. We have a four to five year lower life expectancy, higher rates of mental and health issues, depression, and suicide. I often wonder in this era of social justice, social and racial justice, will Mowekma finally see justice or will our communities, our academic institutions, our local and state governments continue to polit politically erase us by ignoring and marginalizing our people? Or will we choose to rise together in solidarity to not only acknowledge America's original sin against the Native Americans and against the Mowekma Ohlone people, not only to apologize for the pain and generational trauma that continues to affect all my people, but to actually choose to finally push back and demand, and demand justice for Mowekma, the restoration of our federal status as an American Indian tribe. Thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman uh, Nijme and Vice Chair Ariano for that amazing welcome. The necessary information you provided and for being so gen generous with your time this evening. We know how incredibly busy you are and all of the requests that you receive, especially during Native American Heritage Month. So we're honored that you could spend time with us to start this event in a good way. There's much more for the university to do, but we look forward to building a stronger partnership with the tribe in recognition of the fact that we currently occupy the tribe's unceded land. Thank you again. Before I introduce the next session, I just wanted to take a moment to highlight that it is in fact Native American Heritage Month. While this month is designed to uh, celebrate Native American tribes and individuals, it can be a ex very exhausting time for us. And I generally think of it as the time between when people dress up and mock us on Halloween and Thanksgiving, the annual celebration of our genocide. 
And hey, this year, we even have thousands of people mocking Native peoples in front of millions of others during the World Series. So please keep this in mind when engaging with Native folks, especially during this month. I will now introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Soma de Bourbon, Assistant Professor in Sociology and Interdisciplinary Social Sciences here at FJSU, who will introduce our keynote speaker for this evening. Take it away, Soma. Hi, I'm so happy to be here with all of you tonight. And I'm so grateful for the chair and vice chair for being with us and enlightening us. Um, and we know that social justice is, um, you know, not just a, a word. We wanna think about it as also actions that we can take. So I really appreciate you um, both highlighting the importance of taking action and supporting federal recognition. Um, I get to introduce somebody that I am so excited to introduce that I never thought I would get to introduce, but you know, here we have this wonderful opportunity. Um, Dr. Joe Levette is someone that I have an incredible amount of respect for as a scholar and as a person. He has contributed so much to American Indian studies and our understanding of native-centered community-based ethical practices of research and scholarship. Dr. Joe Levette is from the Atacapa Ishak Nation of Louisiana. He is an accomplished, internationally recognized researcher, educator, author, and community member. He is professor and chair of ethnic studies at UC San Diego, as well as the founding director of Native American and Indigenous Studies at UC San Diego. Formerly, he was the department chair of American Indian Studies at San Francisco State University. He is the author or editor of nine books. Yes, I said nine. <laughs> um, in print or forthcoming, including the Lammy Award nominated Indian Blood, HIV and Colonial Trauma in San Francisco Two-Spirit Community. He has also written numerous journal articles, chapters, reviews, and community studies. His scholarship examines Native American, Indigenous, Creole, Black, Latinx, queer, mixed race, and comparative ethnic critical ethnic studies. Please join me in welcoming the amazing Dr. Andrew Jolivet. Thrivance. The smoke from the Boucherie fire still burns. Smoked meats and fried gratons fill our stomachs. There along the water, they keep dancing. There hidden in the bayou, children keep dancing. Say, they out there stomping again. Ain't nothing wrong with that, yeah. We got to keep eating me, yeah. My great-grandmother, they called her Nanan. She was a treater, or tateur, and a quilt maker. The patches make a pattern, a circuit. Say, who your people be? You a Guillory? What you say, Shab? Me too. I'm kin to the Guillory. We are patterns sewn together by old wrinkled hands and fat thumbs dangling from a ma's big arms, big arms from spinning her spoons in the gumbo pot, big arms from tapping our behinds with the switch from magnolia trees. We still stand in here, but we march too. We have done more than survive. Who says we are forgotten? I remember, you remember, we remember, remember our birthplace, our land, our water, and our songs. So we sing again. We stomp our feet in the ground where Nanan stopped bleeding with her medicine. We stomp our feet where Pop fed the people. The cotton fills the quilts. The crawfish still float to the top when we flood them out. Creation begins with all our relations. So we stomp and we live and we begin again. We thrive, we thrive, and we thrive. We are a people. We are a circuit <clears throat> connecting past to present, singing songs for their futures. So let us thrive, let us thrive, let us thrive. Yatowi Hokisakus, Andrew Jolovet, Tizikip Opelusa, Takapo Ishak, Yekti Ishak. Good evening, relatives. My name is Andrew Jolovet. I descend from the Tizikip Opelusa here on clan of the Atakapa Ishak of the Sunrise Peoples, born at the eastern side of the Atakapa traditional homelands in southwest Louisiana. I am the son of Aneta and Kenneth, grandson of Isabella and Andrew, Gertie and Howard, 
the great grandson of Leela and Curtis, Eva and Edward, Rosina and Francois, and Ali and Eli. I was born in Yalamu, the traditional territory of the Romatish Ohlone and the Moekma Ohlone of the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, and what is today called San Francisco. Words matter. If nothing else that I say um, tonight to all of you is that I think our words matter um, and how we speak them into existence, how we live them in existence. Today, I live and speak to you from the traditional unceded Kumeyaay territory at the man-made border between what is known as San Diego and Mexico. I want to acknowledge and give all thanks and blessings to the organizers of today's opening event and send blessings for the coming days and weeks of program, programming that will come. You are indeed correct. Uh, this month can be very tiring. I was joking with a friend the other day. I said, interesting, Native Heritage Month and Black History Month, they're the shortest months, aren't they? <laughs> but you know what? It's every day. And I thank you all for um, doing these events. And I thank you for the work that you're doing every day to really truly support the Moek Maloney and other tribes. Um, of the San Francisco Bay Area and all across uh, the United States and all across the world. Um, and I want to acknowledge and, and, and also, um, you know, really think about um, the work and the site of which, what does transformative justice mean, right, within and across the university and across some of the external communities, right, that are both sites of ongoing colonial occupation. I want to acknowledge the Moekmo Ohlone, the traditional and ongoing stewards of the territory where San Jose State is built. I further recognize, acknowledge, and, st and stand in kinship with the other indigenous peoples in the territories where you all live and descend from. Um, so if you want in the chat, I know most folks are probably watching from uh, somewhere in the Bay Area, but um, if you're from somewhere else, or if you want to um, you know, share what uh, tribal community you may become from or uh, what uh, land that you grew up in, please share that. And if you don't know, there's a link there um, that I just shared in the chat for you to, to, to share and acknowledge your ancestors, your relatives, um, and also the indigenous peoples on the land and territory where you were born or where you're watching from. And I also want to acknowledge the labor of enslaved African and enslaved California native peoples. Let me say that again, enslaved California native peoples, which we seldom if almost never talk about the fact that those missions were concentration camps. They were plantations. That unpaid free labor was slave labor on the heads of native California women, men and children and enslaved African people. <clears throat> So when I think about what it means to thrive, I think about the land. I think about the place-based memory, right? That so many of us think about when we go to those earliest memories in our mind. So I think of Louisiana, the place of my ancestral homelands. And I think of the Bay Area, the place of my upbringing. The Bay Area has a long history of activism and community engagement across intertribal communities dating back to time immemorial and perhaps most famously remembered through the occupation of Alcatraz Island by the Indians of all tribes from 1969 to 1971. This led to sweeping changes across this nation. For the first time, even though I don't wanna say that that was this, the starting point, we always resisted from day one, from that contact period, right? And <clears throat> that moment though was for the first time, I think internationally, that so much attention was, was brought forward that we saw real change and there's still much more work to be done. <clears throat> so as today in this event marked the beginning of American Indian Heritage Month, let us take a moment to remember and acknowledge not only the legacy of the ancestors on Alcatraz at that time, but so too let us remember the work of California Indians today in the present from those working on federal recognition, sacred sites protection, rematriation, repatriation of the land, and on other forms of justice for all nations, let us think about and celebrate Ohlone leaders in the Bay Area today, like Charlene Nishma, tribal chairwoman of the Moekma, as well as her legendary mother, Rosemary Cambra, former tri tribal chairwoman, 
Anne Marie Sayers of the Mutson Ohlone and Tribal Chair at Indian Canyon, Karina Gold, Tribal Chair of the Confederated Villages of Lejean, Ohlone Cafe creators and language revitalization leaders, Vincent Medina, Chichenyo Ohlone, and Luis Trevenio, Rumson Ohlone, Louise Miranda Ramirez, Tribal Chairwoman of the Ohlone Costanoan Eslin Nation. So many different folks. We forget the people who are right here, those of us who are guests on their territory. So let us remember that we are guests and to ask permission. And so many other native men, women and two-spirit organizers, both California native and intertribal leaders who have been in this area for generations making new traditions as well. In every area from public health and wellness to language revitalization and issues related to NAGPRA, Native American Grave Protection Repatriation Act, the Bay Area has played a key role since that Alcatraz occupation. In my work with the Native American Health Centers in San Francisco and Oakland, as well as with the American Indian Cultural Center of San Francisco, <coughs> as the former executive director and current board president, I have worked with others across tribal and na na um, nation state identities to foster a greater sense of kinship as opposed to allyship. We don't need you to be our allies because allyship is transactional, right? Allyship, you do something for me and I will later do something for you. What we need is more kinship. I've tried to think about our work as ceremony rather than research or teaching or even organizing or activism. What if we shifted the way that we think about this place-based memory, thrivance, the change we need to see that the chairwoman talked about? That if we think about that as kinship, as about our relationships and our responsibilities to one another, how might things change? <clears throat> so when we reframe the way that we talk about these issues and when we center place-based knowledge and memory, we can heal from our collective traumas, but we must first shift from a place of reaction to a place of proactive inheritance refusal. This term I have been talking about lately, inheritance refusal is, <clears throat> there's so much legacy, particularly missionaries, Missionaries did so much damage, right? There's cultural genocide and there was the physical genocide that happened. Um, the cultural genocide lasts much longer than that physical sort of violent form, right? Where you try to take over the way that a people think and feel about themselves. <clears throat> and so when we center place-based knowledge and memory, we can heal from those collective traumas. But we must first shift, as I said, from this proactive, from this reactive to the proactive and there are so many colonial ideological um, sort of practices and um, approaches that our communities have internalized. And these are not the type of inheritances that we should ever accept again. So we refuse your colonial inheritance, right? We accept that inheritance of our ancestors, our own original teachings, right? So we must call out on <clears throat> um, call out every ongoing act of colonial violence from here in the Bay to across the world from Etiaroa, New Zealand to the Mariana Islands, to the Chamorro, to the Borican, to Australia, the Ainu, to the Zulu and the Maasai, to Ohlone and Métis. We have to transform our educational and health systems and our relationships with non-academic communities. We don't need more Indian experts. We need more expert Indians. There is no better example for the need for expert Indians, not Indian experts, <clears throat> than right here at San Jose State University, where anthropology professor Elizabeth Weiss has been in the news for her display of American Indian human remains of a Moekma relative, as if our lives and the lives of our ancestors don't matter. This isn't science, don't be mistaken. As I've said many times before, if you wanna study ancient remains and do science, go dig up Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, or Yanipero Sarah and study their bloodstained genocidal remains. Her defense, Ohlone, you know, her defense, Ohlone remains are no different than Egyptian mummies. Hello, exactly. So stop digging up African and Egyptian people as well. I want to hear tonight, call on the university re to return all the items of cultural patrimony, as well as all human remains to the Muwekma and other Ohlone and other indigenous peoples being held by faculty on this campus. 
I also call, call on President Susan Martin to censure and call for the resignation of this professor. If we need further evidence of why this matters, we can also turn to the recent example of the Riverside math teacher, Candace Reed, who was suspended for her mockery of American Indian people, and yet she hasn't still, still hasn't been fired. And in a math class, what exactly was she doing? But this all points to a larger structural problem that is bigger than Weiss and Reed. This is about institutional and structural violence and oppression of indigenous peoples in this state and across the country. We are not dead. We are a living, breathing people and come from hundreds of diverse nations. And so let me say, <clears throat> what was Weiss's response? I'm sure some of you saw it. I mean, just was interesting. Uh, and I, I wrote this somewhere here later on, right? She says, in response to the backlash and to statements by your university provost, Weiss has stated that this is just a quote, woke mob opposed to her pro-science and anti-repatriation views. Well, someone needs to tell her we're not a mob and someone needs to tell her that NAGPRA is not only state but federal law and the failure of this university to do the serious work of repatriation will and should lead to the cancellation of state and federal dollars until all remains and items of cultural patrimony are returned. Alcatraz launched a national and international movement, unlike previous indigenous struggles, where we began to see greater attention to issues like American Indian education, self-governance, and land rights. Yet so many Native nations right here in Northern California and across the country, as has already been said, have not been federally recognized or have not had their federal status reinstated or terminated or simply ignored, while others have been disenrolled or disappeared due to racism and internalized economic greed. We have to return to place, excuse me, to place-based memory, kinship, and collective struggle to address these issues. And so the censure and firing of Professor Weiss, along with meaningful collaborations and partnerships in the form of returning land to the Moekma by this university will be a great place to start, right? So we don't wanna just talk about it, we wanna do something about it. And universities are doing this. I'm not saying anything that should be that controversial. UCSF, returning lands, are talking about returning lands. So many are, right? <clears throat> and so this is interesting, right? Because across indigenous and black communities, these images, right, holding our ancestors' skull. Let us take a minute just to pray. Take a minute when you see an image like that. I, I it, it came to me the, the, to move me to say, let's take a minute. I hadn't planned to do that. You, this is serious. So, you know, if she had held up a portrait or a statue celebrating Hitler, I'm sure there would have been more calls for her resignation. But we continue to see issues for Native Americans relegated to the past. Just look at the Atlanta Braves who continue to think they have the right to dishonor indigenous peoples. For more than 500 years, Indigenous and Black peoples across the diaspora have fought for liberation, self-determination, for visibility, for recognition of our own humanity. Over the course of this history, there have been many moments of convergence between Black and Native people during the early colonial period, during removal and slavery during the early 20th century, and more recently during the civil rights period of the 50s to the 70s, <clears throat> to the present day of Black Lives Matter and I Don't Know More, <clears throat> uh, movements. And today, as we witness another awakening for social change, I want us to think about how we move from just mattering, from being resilient, from surviving or survivance um, to thriving, right? <clears throat> I remember talking to Maori relatives once, and they said, why do you Indigenous folks in the States think that resilience is this great thing? And they said, remember those pop-up plastic dolls? They kind of were shaped like a dome and had sand in the bottom. And you could punch it or hit it, and it would go down and just come back up, go down and back up. They said, that's resilience. You're staying in the same place. And so for me, I've moved away from the idea of just surviving or resiliency. I want to think about indigenous joy, Black joy, 
um, our communities don't want to just be centered in trauma, right? And so, and yet, <laughs> right, even as the media scrambles back and forth between COVID and uprisings over the last several years, right? They like to call riots, but they're uprisings. Um, to challenge white supremacy and police brutality, we are still seeing the brutalization of indigenous and black communities. COVID-19, AKA coronavirus two. <clears throat> Infection, no cure, weaponized, anti-black, mask off. But who wears the mask? Not black boys, not black trans women, not Brianna, not Ahmad, not George, not Harlem, nor Hunter's Point, nor Ninth Ward, pandemic. But what about Henrietta Lacks? What about Tuskegee? What about running face sickness, smallpox? What about our grandmothers? Where were the masks hidden inside diseased slave ships upon dead bodies on diseased blankets? Don't touch me, don't touch that, you'll get it, they spread it. Why do they let them in, said my Uber driver. Just let us go back to work. But where was the work before? Where was the freedom before? white men and guns and sheets, but not 1850, it's 2020. Fear abounds on planes and schools and hospitals, all the places you should feel safe. But where is our safety? <clears throat> Can you hear the cries of broken bones now turned to ash? Can you smell the rotten flesh of ancestors long since decimated? When we wake, what fears do we make? What refusals do we give? Do we even have a say? The greatest and the deadliest is body, is health. So where is the humanity in morning light upon dirt colored by blood, by children, dead wombs, forgotten diseases, forget we shall overcome, we shall thrive. We will not be your pandemic, your plague, your fear, your climate disaster, your slave, whip your own ass, break your own soul, steal your own children, disease your own people. And let us take our hands, stretch them across winds, across rivers, across lands, unseen with our own eyes, and grab hands, squeezing out in drops of sweat, every germ, every lie, every disease, every fear, that we shall not exist, that our ancestors did not exist, that our children will not exist, that we shall not remain, but let us thrive, let us thrive, let us thrive. Respira, respira, respira. Breathe, breathe, breathe. But some of us can't breathe. But let us inhale in all that is good anyway. <clears throat> all that is life, all that is human, stitched together by bone, flesh, and ash. Let us thrive, let us thrive, let us thrive. We are not your disease. We are not your disease and our resistance is more than self-defense. It has to be about thrivance. So I'd also like to acknowledge some wisdom of some contemporary leaders like Nick Estes, a citizen of the Lower Brule Sioux Tribe. He's an assistant professor of American studies at the University of New Mexico. And he was a leader at Standing Rock and many other struggles for indigenous thrivance. Nick reminds us in his book, quote, Indigenous resistance is not a one-time event. It continually asks what proliferates in the absence of empire. Thus it defines freedom not as the absence of settler colonialism, but as the amplified presence of indigenous life and just relations with human and non-human relatives and with the earth, end quote. So under capitalism, right, neither Democrat nor Republican can save indigenous lands or black and indigenous lives. The continuation of state sanctioned racial terror against black and native people <clears throat> from police violence to energy development from one administration to the next demonstrates only radical change in the form of decolonization. The repatriation of stolen lands and stolen lives can undo centuries of settler violence. In his other book, Our History is the Future, Standing Rock versus the Dakota Access Pipeline and the Long Tradition of Indigenous Resistance, <clears throat> he talks about this notion of precarity. And one thing we must challenge in this global moment of precarity is the idea of a newfound solidarity. 
We need more than allies and accomplices, as I said earlier, we need more than performative solidarity. We need kinship. We need to stop using the term, quote, settler colonialism, because it's insufficient in describing the terror and violence that indigenous and black peoples continue to face on sports fields, in classrooms, in fields, in uprisings and protests, even in the halls of Congress where misogyny and homophobia, anti-Indianness continue to hold on to power. We must tell our own truth through radical love. Radical love is when we connect with our relatives and form kinship ties that cannot be severed. Let us remember that the civil rights enjoyed by so many are the result of indigenous and black led movements. And let us not forget that indigenous peoples are both Native Americans and people of African descent are both indigenous. Yet we continue to receive the worst health care, economic access, and are at the greatest risk for incarceration and police violence. For missing indigenous women and girls where we've been, folks have been so active in the Bay Area. I think about the women's water walk that happens in the Bay Area and so many other events and organizing efforts of our strong uh, women warriors um, around MMIW from the US and Canada and Mexico and Latin America as well as other global locations, right? We have to understand how colonization and police inaction and federal policies make it more possible possible for indigenous women to be raped, abducted, murdered, ki and killed, and how police states can kill indigenous women and black women like Breonna Taylor, for example, without impunity, and how white supremacists in Michigan can go armed to the state capitol, threatening their own female governor, right? While black indigenous POC and white relatives in Lafayette Park in DC, you know, um, toward the end of the last administ uh, administration, I won't name, um, before the eyes of the world can savagely gasp and be beaten for presidential photo ops. Let us never be mistaken about the true roots of savagery, terrorism, and illegal immigration. Policies that restrict control and intervening in non-natives coming onto reservation lands is a huge issue that must be addressed, right? So the federal government will say, oh, well, that state is in control of that, and then the state will ignore it, right? So we need true sovereign status when we do have it, not this quasi-sovereign status. Nation to nation means the U.S. can't tell us anything. So I want to encourage all of you who are listening to think about how you can support Indigenous um, and Black relatives and other folks of color, right? in meaningful and sustained ways, not just this month or this year, but for a lifetime, for the generations to come after us. How long have we been asking for the removal of racist statues, Junipero Serra, colonizing him as a saint when he committed acts of genocide, right? How long has it taken to call Indigenous Peoples Day Indigenous Peoples Day? <clears throat> so the removal of this racist imagery, whether it be the Washington football team or the Atlanta they will not be named baseball team, a Columbus statue or pancake syrup that is an everyday signifier to stay in your place. Now is the time to think about our ancestors and the knowledge that they passed down to us. And now is the time to also create radical new forms of knowledge. During the early months, during the early months of the COVID pandemic in 2020, I was contacted by the chief of staff of the World Health Organization special envoy, so who, um, who was in charge of addressing the COVID, um, who was in charge of addressing COVID-19 responses globally. It was interesting because they said, well, we can't quite intervene because it's the United States, but we recognize native nations as sovereign. So, but we're trying to find out what the tribes need. It was this very interesting um, sort of exchange. What it ended up being though, it was a call to activate our communities. So together with other Native relatives, we created the Facebook group, American Indian COVID-19 Resources and Res uh, Responses. And like the dozens of other pages that popped up on social media, like the social distancing powwow or the virtual indigenous commencement, we activated our networks. This was kinship coming together. Our circuits and kinship relations were used to share information and resources and to be in touch with one another all across the world in ways we might not normally be able to. We created a space to tell our stories 
And then the telling of our stories, not only do we enact what I term radical love, we also center our people, our relatives as our best medicine. On December 11, 2012, International Human Rights Day, First Nations Chief Teresa Spence began a hunger strike, calling on Canadian Prime Minister at the time, Stephen Harper, and the Governor General, David Johnson, to quote, initiate immediate discussions and the development of action plans to address treaty issues with First Nations across Canada. Her peaceful resistance, emphasizing the importance of dialogue, catapulted the I Don't Know More movement to a new level of urgency. What began as a resistance <clears throat> against an impending bill in Saskatchewan, spilled over across the border to the United States, ultimately spreading as far as Ukraine and New Zealand or Aotearoa, as a movement empowering indigenous communities to stand up for their lands, rights, culture, and sovereignty. <clears throat> the context for this work was the Canadian bill C-45, the government's omnibus budget implementation bill that included changes to land management on reservations, it attacked the land-based reserve for indigenous people, removed protection for hundreds of waterways and weakened Canada's environmental laws. Indigenous women leaders started a Facebook page to brainstorm ideas and a plan for action. The page was called, I don't know more, as a reminder to get off the couch and start working. And yet we have never been idle. We have never started from a place of violence either. Our youth, our elders are constantly under attack. I want us to remember that I don't know more <clears throat> is more than a hashtag, right? Standing Rock was more than a one-time event. It's a movement. Black Lives Matter is more than a hashtag. These are acts of radical love. These are acts of ceremony. These are acts of relational accountability, responsibility, stewardship to take care of the land and the people around us, all of it, right? for the generations still to come. And they also demonstrate the power of pe all people to enact processes for transformative justice. And like I Don't Know More, so too was another global movement started on Facebook. In 2012, when 17 year old unarmed Trayvon Martin was killed by George Zimmerman, a neighborhood watchman, as many of you know, right know the story, walking home after buying a pack of Skittles at a nearby service station was quote, out of place in their middle-class area, Zimmerman was acquitted for all charges. Alicia Garza retells, <clears throat> retells the, um, the experience on Facebook, quote, Trayvon could have been my brother. I immediately felt not only enraged, but a de deep sense of grief. It was as if we had all been punched in the gut, yet soon people shrugged as if to say, we knew he was never going to be convicted of killing a black child, and what did you expect? Turning to Facebook, Alicia wrote a love letter to Black folks. We don't deserve to be killed with impunity. We need to love ourselves and fight for a world where Black lives matter. Black people, I love you. I love us. We matter. Our lives matter. <clears throat> Shortly after that, right, her co-organizers, Patrice Colors, created the hashtag Black Lives Matters. Opal Tometi created the website. Black Lives Matter was born and the hashtag took off. Um, a year later, it went viral, right? And yet Black Lives Matter and I Don't Know More are more than existing and resisting. These are movements about joy and thrivance as well, and about intergenerational stewardship in forming what John Lewis called the beloved community. So in my own teachings and knowledge system, I wanna offer a model for moving from Black and Indigenous lives mattering, right, to thriving by centering our own, our own place-based knowledge systems I want us to engage our inheritances from our ancestors, but also to know that it's not always the past, it's also the present. We are today right now creating the inheritance that will be for the future. What do we want that to look like? On my mother's grave, it says, may the work I've done speak for me. May the work that each of us do, right? May that work speak for us. So when I started my talk today, I greeted you with an expression in my tribal language, the Ishak language. Um, among the Ishak, we hokasat kus means we are all related or relatives connected. The Ishak ter traditional territory 
uh, extends from the southwest region of Louisiana and Opelousas and St. Landry Parish all the way to southeast Texas into the present day Harris County <clears throat> and the city of Houston. For our people, the concept of kinship has allowed us to not only, quote, survive, but to resist, maintain, and thrive under the brutal conditions of forced land sessions and attempts at cultural genocide. When we go to the water, we are going to be with relatives. We are going to offer prayers. We're remembering and giving thanks for the ability to live and sustain our communities because of everything that the land offers. When I reflect on my 44 years in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, I think about and remember the land and the people, many of whom are now ancestors who taught me how to be in community, how to be respectful, to look and listen first before speaking. I think about dear friends and leaders like Randy Burns, who helped start Gay American Indians, which then became a national movement. I think about the ancestor, our recent ancestor, Helen Wakazu, um, who started the Friendship House in San Francisco and her husband, Marty, Martin Wakazu, um, who <clears throat> was a leader when Urban Indian Health Centers first started developing in the 1970s during relocation. Uh, I think about Mary Trimble Norris of the American Indian Child Resource Center and Morningstar Gali and her work in International Indian Treaty Council to continue the work of the Sunrise Gatherings on Alcatraz Island or her work to fight for missing, murdered and indigenous women. <clears throat> I think about my other dear sister, April McGill, working on urban Indian health issues and directing the American Indian Cultural Center in San Francisco so that a new generation <clears throat> and our elders might gather in a central place and realize a decades long dream. I think about all the Ohlone people and what they have done and continue to do daily, moment by moment, breath by breath, what the Ohlone people have done to preserve their languages, their culture, and how the people are indeed all related. And that when we come together in kinship and in collective memory, we can build a better world. So I wanna wrap up tonight by um, encouraging each of you, Native and non-Native alike, to write a personal mission statement or commitment statement with the three to five actions you can take directly to support California Indians, the Muwekma Ohlone first and foremost, if you are connected to San Jose State and the San Jose area, or just the Bay Area period, and other American Indians and indigenous people living and breathing in this territory. When we say we hokisakus, we say go to the water and see a relative. When we see one another, we also must see a relative. And we must remember that our relatives, our brothers and sisters, they are our very best medicine. So as we give, so as we love and remember the activism from the Bay, from Alcatraz that led to sweeping changes from the American Indian Relig Religious Freedom Act, to the Indian Arts and Craft Act, to the return of tribal status, to formerly terminated nations, to sweeping reforms all across the US from the Bay to the world. Let us remember that when we become free, when we become our ancestors' dreams realized, <coughs> that is magic. So let us give it all to the people and always remember that each of you is sacred. Each of you is sacred and see your relatives, see the other people next to you as sacred and you will always treat them with respect. This is what that professor who desecrated our relative did not understand. That sacred life and air you breathe that you have deeper responsibility to something greater than yourself. Give it all to the people we hokisakus, we are all relatives. Give it to the people. When shadows come, when disaster strikes, when sorrows invade, give it all to the people. Give your love, give your heart, give your commitment, give it all to the people. When you fear failure, when you are silenced by machines, when you have lost your will, when you lose sight of footprints and sand, give it all to the people. Give your breath, give your light, give your vulnerability, give it all to the people. Make the people your sacred love. 
Make the sands of immortality your salvation. Make love to justice, make love to city streets. When all around you seems unforgiving, give your breath, give your spirit, give your talent, give your will, give it all to the people. Give as it has been given to you, the people, your mothers, grandmothers, the people, your fathers, grandfathers, the people, your ancestors, your ancient ones. Give as it has been given to you. Sacrifice, nurture, love unconditionally. Whisper beauty through concrete walls. Whisper beauty through institutional systems. Whisper beauty in day and in night. And when all around you seems like defeat, give your breath, give your spirit, give your talent, give your will, give it all to the people and remember you are sacred, you are sacred, you are sacred. You are of and by the people. And when you give, you become free. When you give, you become flesh, the flesh of all the people. You become rebirth, you become the light, you become a link, you become all the ancient ones, you become the answer you become all of the people over and over again. Iweo Mezi, thank you so much, relatives. May you be blessed. May your journeys be very blessed. Hello, everyone. We are going to do some questions for our speaker. I just want to um, say I'm so grateful for you, Professor Jolivet. I mean, I I know how much you have influenced my own thinking, and we do happen to share an amazing friend, Dr. Carolyn Dunn. Um, <laughs> but I'm I'm just so grateful for your words of encouragement and your words of wisdom in what we need to do. Um, we can start maybe with the, there's a question in the chat and um, let me see. Yeah, so the question is, what are two to three metrics um, for SJSU community can use, that SJSU community can use to assess our progress in racial justice by this time next year? It says, is it accomplishing our mission statement? Well, hmm. so what, I don't know, what, what are your thoughts on that, given that SJSU is at a time where Native staff and faculty are not feeling like, not feeling necessarily safe on our campus, not necessarily feeling that we even want to be on this campus sometimes. So I think it's a, it's a difficult time, and I think this kind of is a good question, thinking about like, what are some metrics, what, are, what should we look for? Um, as metrics for change? The first thing I would say, or maybe this is the only thing for now, because maybe it's one thing at a time. Sometimes we try to put so many things on the table and then they're just things on paper that live in an administrator's office that gets sent out and recycled over and over again. And so I think one thing to look for is, can the university create what I call thrivance hubs? Can it create places where people, Native people, Indigenous people, people of color, women, LGBTQ folks, all people really, but those who feel most unwelcome, right, where they can thrive? And so what that means, right, that's one thing, but under that one thing, there's probably a million things that you have to then look for. Are there MOUs? Is there an MOU between the Moekma and San Jose State University? What is the university's commitment to the tribe? Is there land on campus that they are willing to, you know, make use of or, you know, rematriate to, to the tribe? Um, are there spaces that there are, what about signage? And what about the Moekma language, which is alive and well? We saw that tonight very clearly. You know, are there signs in the Moekma language on campus, right? Um, visible signs, are there <coughs> contemporary signs? Um, and again, measurable progress. Hey, one thing, and, and it's, it, it, I said it tonight, fire that pr professor. I know she has tenure. I know there's limits to what folks can do, but they can censure, right? If they can fire the identity, you know, imposter professors or force them to disappear from these universities, what was her name? The uh, La Bombera, the one who's pretending to be an Afro-Latina somewhere back east. 
she just quietly disappeared. I'll just be frank. I mean, these sort of blatant examples um, have to be addressed. That's how we know we're making progress when blatant exam. And I'll give you credit. I mean, I did go to look. I said, was their president said anything? I don't want to say anything and get all at their president or administration. And your provost did. Your provost made, did make a, a strong statement. I think the president needs to follow up. I think I'm sure they're discussing it. And from what I've heard from a few folks, and and you know, I think there needs to be pressure there. But ultimately, it's also about universities or sites are ultimately why are we there for the student for students for young people for or not even just young people but students come in all ages we're there for students <clears throat> we're there for the community we wouldn't exist if it wasn't for community and so i think that the university needs to do regular sort of institutional gut checks of how are students feeling do they want like how are they do they want to be there don't just tell me Ooh, we're 60% students of color or something like that, these stats they like to throw out. But that doesn't do anything if there's not a qualitative cultural difference, right? That's just a majority population being governed and ruled and controlled by a minority population, right? That is apartheid. So I think we really have to think about you know, not just programs or butts and seats, but also ideas. How do we change the way that, you know, folks are thinking, right? Your university president is there, there's a, there's a cabinet, there's government relations, I think, right, Ryan, I think is, which is awesome that you have a native person and in the government relations. I think that's, that's outstanding. Is there an advisory council made up of Moekma leaders and other indigenous leaders who will advise the president on issues related to native students? Is there a NAGPRA advisory board on campus? There's so many, I mean, you know, um, and is that advisory board, you know, are they, are, I mean, quite frankly, are they in compliance, right, with state NAGPRA, not only federal NAGPRA? Um, and so I, I, there's a lot of things. And it's not just about attacking that which is broken. It's also building up that which is wonderful and, 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 and good, right, um, that is joy producing. And so I think that's where these kind of thrivance hubs, these spaces where we can actually build, right, and grow is, is so important. Thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Um, Ryan, did you want to ask the next question or do you want me to ask some questions? I'm not sure if there were any in the chat. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I do have a question I'd like to ask here. Um, in thinking about how place-based knowledge is central to building an, Amer an American Indian Studies program on campus, what advice might you give to campuses that are currently developing such a program for the first time on our campus? Well, number one, it's so funny. I did a presentation earlier on this topic, research justice at um, City University of New York and City College of New York. Um, and one of the things we're talking about about research justice, don't assume to know what communities need or want. So the first thing is, it's not about asking questions, it's about letting folks tell their story, right? And hearing our stories. Um, so I think the first step is building relationships um, and letting folks, um, yeah, someone's saying that I, I, I understood the meaning of, they don't think they understood the meaning of place-based knowledge. So basically thinking about how do I understand where I'm at and what the, the place where I'm at, it can mean many things to be honest with you. In some senses, for some folks in indigenous communities, but folks might read that as, is it a sacred site or a site that's very significant or meaningful? Like in Louisiana, maybe there's a partic you know, particular mounds that might be significant, places where people would go for, for prayer or ceremonial grounds. I am talking about that, but I'm, I'm actually talking a little bit more generally and or specific, right? Because I think it depends on what a place means to you, right? So how does understanding where I'm rooted, where I've grown up, where my family is from, right? Um, and how that, that informs the knowledge that I hold and then what I do with that knowledge, right? So what is it that I know about the place that I'm um in right whether i'm from there originally or not 
Um, and what can I learn about it, right? So I think it's starting from, and also this all has to start from a place of humility. Because most, of, a lot of times we don't know very much at all about the, the, the place in which we are in. And so I think it's also about um, developing a greater understanding for that place um, using place-based knowledge. So it's understanding <clears throat> who's the, the land that you're on too, right? And the people who've been in that, who stewarded that territory, right? Um, and so I think part of it to give you an example, and I, I wish we had had more time and maybe done this tonight, even as a cultural exchange, I know when I was um, speaking at UC Santa Barbara earlier last year, and it doesn't happen often in COVID, it's been tricky, um, but doing truly like exchanges, right? When you go into someone else's territory, really, like I said, we're all guests. I'm not Moekma, I'm a guest, right? I'm not California native, I'm a guest. Um, and so really to have that exchange and to have actually been in the presence of the leaders here tonight and ask their permission to be in this territory and to speak here, that is actually having, that's an example of place-based knowledge, right? So it's about developing relationships, I think, not just to people, but also to the land. And the, or I should say the ecosystem, because not just land. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I think um, sometimes we, even if we're in this field and thinking about American Indian studies, we're like, we know what, what people want. It's like, no, we don't necessarily know what people want. We don't know um, what, you know, community wants unless we ask, unless we involve them. So I really appreciate you highlighting that we don't have the answers. Um, there was another question posed and it says, speaking of building up that which is good, are there places we can turn to for models of what thrivance looks like? What kinds of supports nurture thrivance? You know, this also came up a little bit earlier, I think. Um, you know, two things that I mentioned today, and I guess I'll share them again that I thought are interesting. I think it's when they're led by community, anybody can do it. So that's even the thrivance hub, this whole idea is like, What's something I love and let me take it on, take it up and, and do something about it, right? <clears throat> so I was talking about the research around my book, Indian Blood in the Bay Area. And it started around the same time when I was starting to talk to folks um, that the Two-Spirit Powwow started. The Two-Spirit Powwow in and of itself and what Bates, Bay Area American Indian Two-Spirits have done is a wonderful example of what thrivance looks like in, 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 in reality as a model, right? <clears throat> To take, because thrivance, as I, how I've defined it, is that where we take negative, you know, and positive experiences from pre-colonial, uh, you know, colonial and post-contact experiences to find places of joy so that we might be able to thrive, to heal. Um, so I don't think it's simply that we just jump right to the thrivance point, right? Um, I think that Two Spirit Power came up because. Sometimes two-spirit folks maybe didn't feel as welcome in other powwows or they wanted a, a different kind of, you know, um, space. And so instead of saying, well, this other space, well, they respected that that space had a, holds a particular, um, you know, tradition. And they created one. I think another example I talked about today was Native American Health Center runs a, a conference every year called um, Culture is Prevention such a wonderful thing, a, a, a gathering, an event, because it really is focused not so much, and I remember when I spoke at that event, we talked about culture as medicine, which I was talking about a little bit tonight, is that I think even when we, when we turn to that part, right, we're also seeing the best of ourselves, right, that is not to even prevent something, it's that our culture is what makes us whole and well. Um, uh, another example I think I had talked about, this was in, um, African American community at the talk earlier, I was talking about the, uh, that they created a black joy parade in Oakland. I'm like, hello, like that, if that's not thrivance and thriving, right? Um, so many examples, or even like I mentioned briefly in, in passing in the talk tonight, some friends who's created the women's walk, uh, the native women's walk, where they go out to Ocean Beach, where they go and they've made ceremony. This all allows us to thrive. Um, there's just so many gatherings. I think the sunrise, so they're small and big. I don't know that it's always like a, there's a, it's going to be an organizational thing. I think we have to even just that someone gifted me some beautiful earrings or 
someone, you know, like when you said your introduction, I was like, oh, I was like, oh, I'm gonna tear up over here. I mean, it was very kind, right? And that's how we, I think the key to thriving as a model or example to me is you can't thrive until you create positive relationships with people. It doesn't cost anything, right? Other than, well, I don't really think it costs anything. I think it depends on, and then some folks say, well, do we want, it? everybody's not a good relative. Do I want to be in kinship with everyone? You can choose. I think you also choose. It's just like, you know, when we talk about family relations, sometimes all family isn't like the positive relationship we want it to be. I think you love the person anyway and you move forward, right? Many of us have to move on from relationships that aren't good ones. Then you maybe send love to that person anyway and you move on. Because if you hold hate, that's only going to drown you out. It's not going to do anything, you know, for that person. So I, I think those are, you know, some spaces. I think about the American Indian Cultural Center, which I've been working with since 2015 to get that off the ground. And Anytime we gather or we have a board meeting and, and or we get together, we have a feed. Uh, I think about my house before I left and moved here to San Diego and we had a native feed just because I wanted to thank folks, you know, for all the gifts and, 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 and community. Those are spaces of thrivance. That's a thrivance hub. That's, that's how we started anyway. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, I have lots more questions, but um, let me see if I pull one up. Um, but one thing I was thinking about before I go to the other questions I had prepared was you were talking about these places of thrivance. And I know for community members, especially if you are in the San Francisco Bay Area, you know, your work has been so impactful for um building bridges and making connections with other folks and making people feel welcome in these spaces, those especially marginalized folks that maybe have not felt as welcomed, particularly native, you know, queer native folks. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that that San Jose is doing is this like reimagining safety and reimagining, you know, these campaigns with these catchwords like reimagining um, community. And I noticed in a couple of focus groups that I did with Native women that they mentioned resources in San, San Francisco. The Friendship House was mentioned several times, like, hey, we need something like that. So I guess, I, I, you know, kind of selfishly, I'd like to know your advice for like this community um, that I love as someone who, you know, is an American Indian Alliance council member and works at the Indian Health Center. Um, you know, what, what advice would you give for building up some of the resources um, and, and some of the connections that you've been so central in creating in San Francisco. Yeah, no, thank you too, because you reminded me of another actually really great example. Um, they're building an Indian village in San Francisco. Um, and this was part of Helen Wakazu's work with Friendship House and Peter Brad and April McGill, who I mentioned from in Cultural Center and we're, you know, been talking about that, but it'll house like, it'll be seven floors. It'll be Kind of a one of a kind facility in the country. Um, Canada, I when I was up in Toronto, has similar their uh, American Indian um, community center there. I think that the first thing is actually, and this is something where the university could take the lead. It's about sometimes it's about the individual folks. I think right communities coming together, but that's why I said member earlier about an MOU, a memorandum of understanding. How about San Jose State if they don't have one? let's work on one, make that be the thing this year then, right? I said, there's one thing, maybe that's the one thing. Do an MOU with Moekma where there will, because tribal chairs will, you know, come and go, presidents will come and go, faculty, um, spell out what the terms are of that relationship, but maybe one of them is to create a scholarship program or a center on campus if one doesn't exist. Where do I also see Thrivance happen? On some of these college campuses, some of the best examples I've seen are in the Pacific Northwest. Um, University of Washington has a great center they built. Um, Oregon State, I was trying to say it was Oregon State or University of Oregon, Oregon State, right? <coughs> Create spaces, right? Um, where these things, and I think out in community, I think the same thing. I mean, I think, you know, partnering and actually being in Silicon Valley, they need a support this, they need to pay for it. They should be, right? Um, and so I think, and I think the first 
before all of that though, is talking and having conversations with people from other communities <coughs> um, that have been successful. <coughs> I think the Bay Area and Sacramento probably make sense as places to talk to folks because there are fewer recognized tribes in these areas because I would say, hey, talk to SoCal people too, but it's a very different reality, I think, for the tribes here in Southern California in, in terms of um, recognition and ability to do certain things. But the more collaboration that can happen across communities, I think the better. Um, I don't know, actually, this is, I should know this, but I've been so Bay Area, or say, when I say Bay Area, but I'm probably saying San Francisco and Oakland, because those are where I lived and grew up. Um, you know, I don't know, is there a, um, does the city have a heritage um, celebration or event? Yeah, so I think things like that are great. I remember actually Santa Clara Health Center, we recognized the director there at our event some several years back as a, it, it was part of what used to be the KQED um, American Indian Hero Awards. Um, so I think, you know, there's so many things, the university or the health center or other organizations there could establish things that don't exist that they wanna see happen. Recognize you had two brilliant Moekma women leaders talking tonight, honor them, recognize them, recognize her mom who spent nearly 50 years, well, more than 50 years, but I think in specific sort of adult leadership doing this kind of work, recognize that the university could honor her, make there a day, Rosemary Canberra day, you know? Awesome, thank you. Um, so let's see, let me ask uh, maybe one more question. We'll see how much time um, we have after that. So this question is, so your research, you know, you're in your book, Research, Met research Justice Methodologies for Social Change, you write about sacred methodologies or research as ceremony as ways to disrupt colonial modes of research. For those in the audience who are unfamiliar with ethnic studies methodology, but particularly with these methodologies that you talk about, could you explain what is different about those methodologies versus colonial methodologies of research? I know, big question. Okay, could you do that in 30 seconds? No, what well, you did in a book, you know? <laughs> actually, actually, I think it won't take that long. Probably just because I had to talk about it earlier today. Um, really, it is about kind of what I've just been saying. It's about the approach and the relationship. It's not starting from a place of, oh, let me go fix this problem that X group has. Like research shouldn't be about assuming there's something wrong with people, right? Um, and that's what we've done. We've pathologized American Indians, Native people as already, always already damaged. Um, and so I think the first thing is we have to invite and create relationships first. <coughs> and instead of seeing research participants, we should see brothers and sisters and kinfolk, <laughs> right? Because then the responsibility of that changes as I was mentioning to the folks in New York earlier today, it's like um, IRB, Institutional Review Boards, they're basically um, not there to protect people, they're there to protect the institution, right? They are, I, at first I said, they're like prisons. And I said, wait, no, they're not the prisons. They're the courts that then put you kind of in the prison, right? They're the kind of this arbiter, right, this space where it's supposed to be just, and it's not, right? Um, and so I think number one, the main thing is, and then we were talking about, because in it I talk about moving, you know, research justice and how it sets up this idea that I talk about or a framework, collective um, ceremonial research responsiveness. And really it's this idea that we're working together collectively, that it's not me telling others, like this whole notion of insider outsider relationships that the best person to ask questions about another community is someone who's not from the community. Who ever thought that was smart? That is the dumbest thing ever, right? So it's all these things when we think about actually these colonial approaches to things, they make absolutely no sense. Like when we think about our wellness, I was saying, you go to a doctor, you need to have your breast examined or your prostate checked. Who wants to go to some strange person you've never seen and met in your life before? Or maybe you've seen five times once a year and they're supposed to do this intimate kind of thing. Like, 
And then we think about that in terms of our mental health and other things. I think that really all of this is to say is that we want to shift from um, a pyramid model where it's all about sort of Western empirical, quote unquote, fact-based knowledge, because those aren't even facts. Facts to whom, right? They've tricked everyone into kind of thinking this is unbiased, right? Everything's biased, folks. Um, and so um, it's really shifting from that, I think, to um, understanding that subjective work is actually important. That is probably the best work is coming from someone who actually is um, part of that community because they care more deeply about it. I shared my own experience. This is someone who's been living with, you know, HIV AIDS since 2002, right? So nearly 20 years and then doing research in that, in that area or, build, or in building community in that area, um, that process, and I talk about that, I think in the book, was just as much healing uh, for me as I hope it was for the people that I was making community with. Um, so I think we have to, you know, and some people might, well, that doesn't work for every discipline, or maybe this is what ethics that, you know, if y'all don't, don't, don't do it, then go do, stick to your econ and, and other areas or whatever, sociology, I'm a sociologist, but I think even those areas, that kind of research and econ and sociology also needs to happen. How do we understand the world, um, and our place within it and our relationship to the research? Um, is really important. I appreciate that, especially, sorry, there's gonna be dinging because I don't know how to turn it off, but um, <laughs> especially given all that's going on right now um, in on our campus and, you know, being called a mob and and all of the, the native folk and folk who are doing ethnic studies on our campus being attacked. It's been, it's a rough space, right? And so I really appreciate you saying that and centering that as part of the discussion. Um, so I've just been told by the organizer that we can call it here that you have done so amazing. It's hard to imagine um, having more, you know, longer conversation about more amazing topics. I would say um, as someone who has appreciated you and your work for many, many years, I just, I'm grateful to all you have given to our community, especially urban Indian community and your leadership has, has really touched my life. And I think I have heard that from countless people, how you have touched their life. And so um, I'm grateful for you and I'm grateful for you sharing this time with us during like, this is a difficult time for a lot of people and I'm just grateful for you and all you've done for us. So thank you. And I don't know if Jamal, if you want to, if anyone's saying something last, or if I'm like the last word on, on the, the <laughs> conversation, Jamal. And before, if I don't know if anyone, Jamal will, but thank you so much. That, that means so much. And, and um, because it is such a very difficult time and sometimes we don't know all the things going on in the world. So your words have an extra special um, uh, meaning. Um, I see a very long, thing here oh he said we just say goodbye to everyone so i guess um you know to closing this out i would just say that it was so important for us to start with moekma so important to start sorry so important for us to start this conversation with your words of healing and centering um you know radical love and all of your work so so thank you for that we needed it and I hope you all have an amazing evening. And so thank you, Professor Jolivet. It's just amazing to be with you tonight. Thank Goodbye, you. Bye, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.